Hey friends, thanks for joining me, Jim Baroud, to hear a few insights from leaders who represent our innovation ecosystem. Today's chat is with Fred Hassan, the chair of the Carrot Group and director at Warburg Pincus. He is also the former CEO of Sharing Plow and a board member at Amgen and several other biotechs. Why don't you talk about your esteemed career and what you're doing now? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jim. It's truly a pleasure to be part of this uh, program. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for making the time to listen in. Uh, so first, just a few words about me. Um, I uh, grew up in Pakistan. I came to this country a long time ago in 1970, uh, Harvard Business School. Uh, and also, uh, I'm a chemical engineer from Imperial College in London. Uh, but my career has been, been primarily in pharmaceuticals. Uh, I, be I became CEO at uh, uh, four big uh, pharma companies, all, all global pharma companies, Pharmacy and Upjohn, uh, then Pharmacia after the merger with Monsanto, and then uh, uh, Sharing Plow. And uh, also um, I had a chance to uh, work with uh, Wyatt um, in a senior capacity before it uh, was sold to Pfizer. So, and I've also been uh, the chairman of uh, Bosch and Lom. Uh, and I, at this time, I'm uh, working in private equity. I've been with Warburg Pincus in New York since uh, 09. And uh, uh, as part of that, I look at innovation around the world. I look at pharmaceutical companies to invest in. Many times we buy companies and manage them. And then later on, exit. Uh, so I've been very involved with the ecosystem and I really, really enjoy my life uh, in this capacity. I'm also on five boards, including a large uh, biotech board, uh, Amgen, which is very exciting. Uh, I follow uh, the developments in science very closely. Uh, having had a technical background, it builds a sense of curiosity around learning all the time. And in my case, my big uh, learning has been in biotech and cell biology and other areas, which really weren't that well developed when I came out of school. And it's, it's really exciting to be, at a, to, to be here at this time. I call it the, the bioscience century because never before have we a better knowledge of disease cascades. Never before have we better tools to find the right targets, to validate the targets. We have now very good tools to very fast clinical trials. And we also have the tools to get the innovation out into the marketplace in a much more effective way. So the whole innovation product flow system has improved dramatically. And I, I think that's why we can say that this is gonna be the bioscience century for the future. It's a great time to be here. Well, you know, it's a great time specifically in this battle against this terrible virus uh, and this terrible pandemic. So you have a, a bird's eye view of everything that's going on in the industry. And you have had that for you know, decades, right? So give us sort of um, an overview of how you're seeing, you know, this response, you know, over the past 10 months and today. Yeah, so uh, this COVID is a one in a century plague and I call it a plague because it's, it's uh, totally unusual. It's really had a devastating effect on the whole uh, world. Uh, the cost uh, as estimated by authority, by very good bodies is $25 trillion until 2025, $25 trillion. It's costing the US economy $3 billion a day. So this is, this is therefore uh, a huge, huge uh, situation. And not only is it creating economic distress, it's creating emotional distress and also it's disrupting livelihoods. So it's, it's truly something that uh, has to be treated on a war basis. And I'm very proud to note that science has, has the 21st century bioscience has risen to the challenge of COVID. So the virus uh, first showed up in some visible situation, maybe in late December. By January 10th, it had been sequenced. And by the 10th of December, there was an advisory committee meeting showing that uh, the product uh, works. I mean, the Pfizer product works. This is remarkably quick. 
this is a remarkably quick cycle. This, this cycle time of 11 months is unprecedented. This normally would have taken four years, five years. And we've shown how things can be done very quickly if people make up their minds and they have a resolve to go after it. We now have these mRNA vaccines from two companies that are extraordinarily effective, over 90% efficacy, which is amazing because uh, it actually makes the, the job of finding vaccine failures very difficult. When you do get a vaccine, you look for those instances where the vaccine has failed so as to sequence the virus and to see if more needs to be done to, to deal with it. But in this case, there have been very few failures because it's such a, these are such effective vaccines. And right behind these two vaccines, we have the two vector-based uh, vaccine, the adenovirus vector-based vaccines, which are also very good products. These are from AstraZeneca and J&J. And um, they are going to be here in the first half of next year and hopefully adding to the armamentarium of options against this, uh, this, this issue. And the, right behind that, we have the protein subunit vaccines, which are also very well-known ways of going after viruses and bacteria. So I think we have a lot here and science will conquer COVID. There is a prediction that by the middle of next year, we would have reached herd immunity, which is 70% in the US. In the developed world, the more advanced economies of the world, we would have reached herd immunity by the end of 2021, which means we can move around very easily. And in the entire global world, which also includes the less developed countries, we would have reached herd immunity by the end of 2022. So thanks to 21st century bioscience, this one in a hundred year plague is gonna be brought under control. Well, that is, uh, that is fantastic news. Uh, but, but tell us in comparison, everyone is so um, uh, astounded with how quick this has happened, right? Typically vaccines take how long? Many years, right? Even maybe sometimes 10 years, sometimes 20 years. Sometimes they never get done, like HIV vaccine never got completed. So yeah, they go on for a long time, unfortunately. And this one was quick, uh, which is remarkable. And it was done very well. We, there was enough recruitment of patients to be able to uh, do, get, get those P values, those probability values right, the confidence intervals right. So it, the science was very well done. Uh, the oversight of the whole package for the two mRNA vaccines that have just been approved uh, has been very intense. There's been a lot of transparency uh, by, and a lot of independent experts have weighed in. So the whole process has worked extremely well. What's happened here was a sense of urgency, I think, that prevailed throughout the ecosystem. Typically, uh, when you have a 10-year cycle on a vaccine, maybe three years might be taken up just waiting for feedback from regulators. Now that kind of stuff didn't occur here. Here we had an FDA that was very motivated to get this thing working. In fact, they were looking at data in real time. Janet Woodcock, who was the best official at the FDA, civil servant, the best civil servant at the FDA, was assigned to work directly on Operation Warp Speed. This, this is an example of government stepping up along with the private sector and making it happen. Uh, the private sector, of course, is the driving force in innovation, but it needs the support of the entire ecosystem. And here, not only did the FDA lend its regulatory expertise, it lent, it lent its scientific expertise to help this move along a lot faster. Uh, also, working in parallel makes a big difference. Uh, one reason innovation is a little slow in biosciences is because things work in series. If you can get the manufacturing uh, work stream working in parallel with the clinical work stream, with the development work stream, and even with the discovery work, work stream, and, and allowing some redundancy in the process, because you are going to maybe come up with a molecule that won't go all the way down the road, but doing things in parallel can greatly reduce the cycle time. And the biggest cost of R&D 
is the cost of blocked capital. If you have 14 years of cycle time in R&D, the cost of capital for that blocked time is huge. So if you can reduce the cycle time, that can make a big difference. Here, not only did the cycle time narrow because of the emergency, but it's all actually shown the world how to approach new projects with, warp, with the warp speed mentality. It's not just a linear flowchart of work uh, processes, it's a mentality, how to get things done fast and get them done still with a high quality of science. Great. Now, we have people from around the world on this, uh, on this program today, and they look very educated. So I'm, I'm sure these people know that vaccines, you know, make a lot of sense. But for those who are hesitant, who say this was, uh, you know, developed too quickly, uh, and they're unsure and want to wait or, or just uh, tentative about it, talk to us about how you respond to those folks. Yeah, one of the bad things that happened along the process was that this got caught up in election year politics. We have to understand this is not the Trump vaccine. This is a vaccine that's born out of very good science. We also have to understand that this vaccine is very effective, that it's really, that it does not have the live virus in it. There is a lot of orthodoxy out there that says that these viruses are live viruses that are weakened and they might somehow create an infection. This thing is a synthetic molecule and it is not going to do anything uh, that should be a problem. Uh, we've heard from experts that most issues around vaccinations show up in the first two weeks. And we have data on patients who have had these up to five months now, and nothing has shown up of any consequence. There are some severe adverse effects in some very few people, which are uh, the typical idiopathic, typical hard to explain side effects that occur when you get an injection. But this vaccine is showing the profile of being very similar to that of a flu vaccine when it comes to reactogenicity. Uh, very few, very few issues have developed but the efficacy is stunning, over 90%. The flu vaccine is typically about 50% efficacious. And what we have seen is that this vaccine not only prevents disease, it actually prevents severe disease, which gets people into uh, hospitals and unfortunately a few people into uh, ICUs and unfortunately a few people into, into ventilators uh, and then many people die. It really is... Uh, it's a fantastic opportunity for people to stay healthy and to get this COVID behind us. It's, it's, it's been a fantastic advance in science. Yeah, and I guess it will prepare us well for future viruses, future potential pandemics, correct? Absolutely. This, this platform uh, works uh, very well in other viruses. In fact, one reason the companies went off to a fast start is that they were doing some work with other viruses that they just repurposed onto COVID. Uh, this works very well in RSV, which is another very bad viral infection, and many other uh, viruses. It also has very good applications in oncology, again, in, in, in cancers. So uh, I personally believe that these RNA therapeutics are a very important addition to the armamentarium going forward. I think they are gonna make a huge difference uh, in wherever you're trying to fight pathogens, these RNAs can really make a big difference. So what about the rest of the uh, industry? Aside from COVID, what are you seeing uh, in healthcare, in pharma, in biotech that's getting you excited? So the industry is uh, very good. We have 10 very large companies. We have uh, 20 other moderately sized global pharmaceutical companies. And then we have about 3,000 small companies, which are the innovators. They are generally working on new approaches. And the ecosystem works uh, with the small companies often licensing out their innovations to the medium size or the very large companies. That's, that's the way the ecosystem has worked and will probably keep working in the future because we are an innovation-driven industry and innovation works best in small groups. That's why we're always gonna have small companies. 
Um, the industry is doing extremely well because of certain incentives around, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you the three groups that are getting a lot of attention and funding and, and, and the incentives that they have. The three groups that are getting a lot of attention and funding are number one, oncology, cancer, number two, rare diseases, and number three, uh, inflammation conditions, inflammatory conditions, uh, such as rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis. And the reason for these three conditions getting so much attention from the private sector is because number one, the endpoints, the measurement points are well-defined and very clearly understood. Number two, the FDA has a positive attitude to helping move these things along. They, 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 they like to see more new products on the market in these categories. And number three, once products get approved, the payers don't give the pharma companies a hard time. There's a much better chance of getting reimbursement. Now, this is great, but we have to remember that there are other large diseases that still need a lot of innovation. Cardiovascular is still the leading cause of death. We need more innovation in cardiovascular. Central nervous system is still a frontier that never really got touched with by, by the biotechnology revolution that much because these biotech molecules are very large. They can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So in, a lot of innovation is needed in central nervous, in, in, in the science of the brain. A lot of work is needed there. And a lot of work is needed in diabetes and those kinds of diseases, which are hard to manage. They're lifelong conditions, and uh, there are over 300 uh, um, million people around the world who, who have, for example, diabetes. So I think we can do more here. And the, the two words I'd leave with everybody are, these are large diseases, but the way to go after them is to do personalized therapy with precision medicine. Personalized therapy means individualized therapy for each person and precision medicine, meaning the specific medicine that will work for that person. Now that we are able to do sequencing uh, very easily, very quickly, and at a very low cost, I think the new science is going to go more toward personalized therapy with precision medicines in these mass markets where in the past we've been using a brute force approach of taking molecules and saying, okay, it does work in 30% of the patients very well, 30% of the patients a little bit, and, and the rest, it doesn't work well, let's get it on the market. From here on, I think the focus is gonna be on sh smaller groups, but with much better drugs for those smaller groups. So I hear what you're saying. Now, what about the, what about what's changed since this pandemic, right? We see a lot more telemedicine. So I think that dovetails into what you're saying. Are there other technologies? Uh, everyone's talking about uh, the Apple Watch or watches that are always uh, sort of surveilling our bodies and sort of uh, providing feedback and data. Yeah, tech is gonna greatly reduce the cost of healthcare. And uh, also it's going to improve the quality of healthcare. So with wearables, you can have monitoring that is uh, 24 seven and early, early signs of uh, intervention, early signs of alarms that can be a uh, basis for intervening early. Many times diseases are not visible until they become visible, but the earlier you find them, the better, and with these uh, wearable uh, systems, you can really learn about an on oncoming uh, Alzheimer's or an oncoming uh, attack of migraine. It can make a big difference, or maybe an oncoming heart attack. It, it can make a big difference. Also, um, telemedicine has been hugely effective. Uh, we were forced to accelerate this, the Zoom revolution, as they call it. Um, doctors are realizing they can be pretty good on the uh, uh, in, on the screen. They, they can do things quite effectively. Uh, patients are becoming better at using the screen uh, for purposes of managing their health. They, they, are, they were used to long, long waits in the waiting room. They might still have to go back in there for certain conditions, but not, not that much in the future. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, I've, I've heard directly from a CEO that they got one of their devices 
to be sent directly to the patient's homes and the doctors gave them instructions on how to use the device at home. And the patients were remarkably good at learning how to do that because they could play the video again and again until they got it right. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's amazing how new things have opened up uh, with, the, with this whole Zoom revolution, which has been kind of used as a way to fight COVID, but in the process has created new habits and behaviors that's gonna be there for a long time and actually add to the productivity of the healthcare system. We have to find ways to bend the cost curve. The cost of healthcare in our country is too high. We have to bend the cost curve. Uh, we, we shouldn't bend the cost curve by rationing care. We should bend the cost curve with smarter care and tech can do a lot to help us with smarter care. Well, that's for sure. And I know we were discussing earlier, our mutual friend, David Shulkin, had a lot to do with this ahead of the pandemic, right? And yes. allowing telemedicine to happen for the VA across state boundaries, you know, collapsing all those barriers that historically have been an impediment, right? Yes, the VA has done a great job in this regard. And I know my friend David Shulkin did a great job trying to standardize the EMRs between different parts of the defense uh, establishment. Um, he couldn't entirely complete his job, but the overall thing that he got going was fantastic. The future of uh, healthcare is interoperability. We need to be able to easily access uh, data in a, in a very low friction manner so that the best patient care can occur for the patient whenever that data is needed. We, we aren't quite there yet, uh, but we have the basic infrastructure in place now. In the last 10 years, 80%, 90% of the doctor's offices are now on EMRs. 90% of the hospitals are on EMRs. Uh, I think we are now at the stage where we can bring all of these together, these disparate systems, and make it easy for the doctor to practice medicine and easy for the patient to get the best care based, based on, on their own best data that should get pulled up very quickly. We are still hearing of stories where EMRs have created problems for doctors. Uh, they call it the pajama time after they've uh, spent a whole day working, uh, just loading in information into, into the EMRs. More can be done in improving workflows in that regard, uh, but it's a huge opportunity that we have such an infrastructure in place, which was not there 15 years ago. Got it. Let's change gears a little bit, Fred. Let's talk about leadership, right? You are one of the most uh, you know, thoughtful and empathetic leaders I know. Um, what advice can you give leaders uh, these days uh, during a crisis? I think it's uh, important uh, to do different things at different times with different priorities. If you are a leader in a crisis, uh, it's uh, even more important to, number one, Take very good of, number one, take very good care of yourself personally because people are gonna rely on you even more. So physical health, emotional health, making sure that you are well-centered and well-anchored. That, because you're gonna be looked at much more intensely than ever before. So if you're a leader in a crisis, you have to take care of yourself very well. Number two, you have to find a team of people around you, senior people, who are like-minded in terms of the mission and who are also willing to defer the gratification and, and make the sacrifices that are needed and who are prepared to carry out the culture that you're trying to create. They have to be culture carriers. Number three, you have to set a very clear plan. Short term, which is the urgency, the medium term where you'd like to get past the urgency and long-term, what the end game looks like. So people can see the dream that's down the road. They have to see the light at the end of the tunnel and you have to be able to, to show that. And number four, you have to communicate, communicate, communicate again and again and again in different ways. Find ways to educate, communicate, listen to people so that everybody stays on the same sheet of music. Everybody says, we are in it together and we're gonna come through this together. Must keep that hope alive in people. And, and finally, I would say execute, execute, execute. Uh, plans are great, hopes are great, dreams are great. In the end, the work needs to get done. All plans need to break down into work. 
that needs to get done. So focusing on execution and, and really being relentless in the follow through and completion is very important and being very flexible on mid course adjustments. If things don't go exactly as planned, make the adjustments and let people know why you've made the adjustments. Make it transparent, stay flexible, but stay relentless right through the crisis until you get to the end goal. That is great advice. Uh, thank you for that, Craig. Now we're on to some questions here, Craig. Considering the federal investment needed to create and bring these products to the market, what if anything should the private sector be charging for vaccines? I think uh, the cost of healthcare is a very sensitive subject. Uh, nobody wants to be accused of profiting off other people's uh, illness. One needs to be sensitive even in times when the federal government is not involved. Uh, when the federal government is involved, as they have been in the case of the vaccines, one needs to be very careful about the pricing. Uh, one needs to be very respectful about the pricing opportunity. And uh, in this instance, I must uh, applaud uh, both the mRNA companies for being very reasonable in the pricing of their vaccines. If this was up out for auction, uh, it, the price would be a much higher, but then the disparity of those who get it would be very high. Uh, the vaccines are being distributed in the right manner. Uh, there is a price premium over very cheap everyday flu vaccines, but it's not a very high price premium given how important these vaccines are to helping bringing uh, COVID under control. And we must really thank the, the government, the US government for their big support toward the infrastructure that has helped us with these uh, vaccines. Well, let's talk about that a bit more, Fred, you know, as far as pricing, right? It's a lot of controversy over the years about uh, overcharging. Uh, and now we have a new administration coming in that is probably gonna be a bit more uh, strict um, how do you see the future of uh, pharmaceutical products? Yeah, this is, I think, unfortunately, a subject that gets brought up every four years with an election cycle. And the biggest problem that I think around pricing, drug pricing especially, is that the drugs are not reimbursed to the same extent as hospital care is and other care is. Uh, a lot of the drugs are paid out of pocket. Uh, so. Uh, one way to really go after this controversy is to make it more equitable in terms of reimbursement for drugs, more in line with the way uh, hospitals get reimbursed. Uh, and drugs are really getting better and better in a dramatic manner. The biggest innovation component of the healthcare system are drugs. So uh, my own sense is they, they should be better reimbursement for drugs, better coverage for drugs. Uh, now that aside, uh, it is good to have a component that is private pay because it creates a sense of responsibility, a sense of uh, respect for the cost of the drugs. And uh, I, I think in that context, uh, our present system where uh, people are paying a very high uh, copay on a pretty fictitious list price, uh, which, uh, which in reality is much higher than the real price, uh, is something that needs to be discussed. I, I think uh, we, 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 we just have to find a better method for uh, uh, the private copay part to be more reasonable. And where there is truly a very large uh, cost that's needed, uh, price to be, that's needed to help the patient, we should try to develop high risk pools where, where we can help patients in special cases for rare diseases where, where the cost is very high. What I'm totally against is the concept of government uh, administering prices or deciding on prices, because it's been shown uh, in country after country that when you turn that over to politicians and bureaucrats, uh, there's a tendency to play favorites. There's, a, there's very poor allocation systems, uh, very slow adaptation to innovation. It, it just would not work. In, it would not be in line with the bubbling science that exists these days. So it should be a free market environment. It should be a responsible attitude by the pharmaceutical industry on pricing, but then also there should be coverage to help patients who get, get stuck with very large bills. Uh, I, I'm all in favor of that. I don't think we have enough of that at this time. 
Got it. Uh, speaking of different parts of the pharma sector, there's a question about the over-the-counter or consumer healthcare market. Do you see opportunities for a significant change in the growth trajectory of this sector versus prior years? In my own career, I particip I've participated in companies that have had over-the-counter products as well as Rx products. I have a pretty good knowledge of that uh, business. Uh, it is growing uh, every year because more and more people are uh, getting educated on their own healthcare. Dr. Google's effect is huge on uh, people's uh, knowledge base. And many times people go and self-diagnose and self-treat before they go to the doctor with their condition. And in most cases, that's very good if it's a minor pain or a minor issue. Uh, obviously, Dr. Google would also tell you that if there are underlying conditions where you need to go to see a doctor quickly, then obviously in that case, one should not just rely only on the OTC product. One should go uh, and see, see a doctor. But OTCs are gonna grow more and more. And I would encourage the FDA to trust the American consumer of the future. American consumers are much more educated on healthcare now than they were before, especially because of the presence of uh, excellent information sources like Google. Uh, so if people want access to drugs for categories like erectile dysfunction, uh, why shouldn't they have access to it? Why must they pay so much money to the intermediaries for their medicines when they can go and pick them up uh, in the drugstore. I'm all for more access by consumers of many categories, as long as there's proper labeling on these medicines for proper use, and as long as there's enough education out there for, for people to be very responsible in the way they use these drugs. Great, great. So here's another question, Fred. Can you comment on the leadership of today's pharma industry and how it has been shaped by your generation of leaders? So I, I've, I was also chairman of uh, Pharma in 0203, and my big uh, pride and joy is I was there when Part D came through. Uh, for those of us who remember the old days, uh, our seniors were not getting drug coverage. They, they were getting all the other coverage that came through in 1965 with the Medicare uh, Act, but drugs were excluded. And uh, people were, the, the coverage ratio was only 60% for seniors. And I take a lot of pride in being part of the group when we managed to get that Part D through in 03. And uh, the coverage for seniors went up from 65% to 90%. Also, the premiums, uh, the, it was estimated that the premiums might be as high as $40 a month for the drugs. But in fact, the premiums came out a lot lower, uh, somewhere close to the low 30s. And the formulary that was available uh, the formulary of drugs that was available was much larger than the VA formulary. So it was a pretty open formulary. It, it was a very good legislation that came through at that time. I think that same sense of doing the right thing for people, the right thing for patients still exists in pharma. I uh, know uh, Giovanni Caforio, who uh, has been in the pharma leadership recently. And uh, I know that he cares deeply for patients. And uh, they talk about this all the time in pharma. I also know Bob Bradway, the CEO of Amgen, who also has been a recent leader of pharma. They are very concerned that uh, the industry come closer to the patients. Uh, of course, the industry that does a lot of uh, work with doctors and hospitals and payers, but the industry is very patient-centric. And I think as, as we go into the future, you will see more of this patient-centricity uh, in the industry in the future as well. Well, let's talk about that as far as how it relates to the COVID crisis and the response to it. Obviously, the industry has risen, uh, you know, to the challenge. But you know in depth these leaders, right, from the scientists, the researchers. Talk to us about that human element. Well, the interesting thing with the COVID response was, first of all, the delegation of responsibility. So I, I happen to know uh, people at Pfizer uh, quite well since I... Uh, uh, I, so since two of the former companies I was with are now part of Pfizer and uh, the plant that uh, 
made the vaccine is the old Upjohn plant in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, so I, I know Pfizer very well. I do know that uh, the CEO personally uh, led the charge there, Albert Borla, and that he gave a lot of responsibility to the, to, to the R&D people. He set them free. He said, please go for it. This is, this is a national emergency. This is a global emergency. It's our moral responsibility to go after it. And it, this sense of moral responsibility created an enormous amount of energy and focus at Pfizer. And that's why this amazing feat has occurred. Many times you hear about the old comments about large companies being huge uh, super tankers, very slow moving. Well, Pfizer has shown that it can be nimble while it can still use its strength of being a global company, but it can be nimble and it can be very patient friendly because people presently are very grateful to Pfizer that these vaccines are available uh, everywhere. Uh, one, one reads about, I, I saw a picture in the local newspaper here in Florida, the first day the Pfizer vaccine arrived in the local hospital on both sides, the healthcare providers were lined up clapping. It was that kind of uh, linkage with the other side that pharma is now getting, which they were not getting in the past. You know, along those same lines, it was so interesting how small companies, you know, BioNTech in, in Germany and Moderna here, small companies in collaboration with large companies uh, really succeeded uh, in, in, in just rising to the challenge and producing this vaccine so quickly. I mean, that's, that's unheard of, isn't it? I mean, it Absolutely. Uh, and Jim, it also shows a partnering mentality. Uh, I think, again, the old uh, thing about pharma was that these big silos, they are not very good to, they're, they're not easy to work with if you're a small company. Uh, well, that's been shown here again, that Pfizer can work very easily with this small company in Germany, BioNTech, and that it can, it can work. It can work very easily, very quickly. Uh, similarly, we're seeing partnerships among large companies. The GSK Sanofi partnership is uh, very impressive. They've had a minor setback recently on purification, but overall, they're going to get their vaccine out there as well. So it's been shown now that not only can large companies work well with small companies, but large companies can come together and go after the same objective, even share information that'll help them get the product out there faster. It, it, it's a new wave of uh, collaboration that we may not have seen before. And I hope that it lasts beyond COVID as well. You know, I found so fascinating the story in the New York Times about the founders of that company. You know, they were Turkish immigrants to Germany. Yeah. And um, it was just a remarkable story. Mother, I mean, uh, husband and wife team. It's amazing. Uh, it's, I, I, haven't, I have not had a chance to meet them, but it's an amazing story. And uh, these are people who went to Germany who uh, just loved uh, the science. Uh, there's even a story that uh, this husband and wife team, both of Turkish origin, uh, married. And then the same day they went back into the lab after their marriage ceremony. So they were that much into this thing. And even before this uh, COVID work, they did some other innovations that were very important. They, they, they did make some money in the process, but for them, the science matters a lot more than money. And we, this is something we've seen everywhere around the world. When, when you're a good scientist and you take a lot of pride in what you do, there's so much joy in succeeding and making progress and helping people. Money, of course, helps, but uh, that's, that's not the main thing. It's really the joy of innovation, joy of bringing out things that help other people. And it's also amazing how our country of immigrants is uh, rising to the challenge. I, I look at uh, all those faces uh, that I see on TV talking about COVID-19, and I, and I note the accents that I keep seeing again and again and again. So Albert Bourla is originally from Greece. He's the CEO of Pfizer. Uh, Stefan Bansel from the other company, Moderna, is from, I, I would assume he might be from France, but he has an accent. Uh, uh, it's just uh, a lot of the experts that you talk to, uh, this Carico, pr Professor Carico, who did the construct on the mRNA is from Hungary, but did the work at Penn. 
Uh, our country is a wonderful country. We attract the best and the brightest from around the world, and it happens here. That's the one thing that we should always preserve going forward. Uh, the best and the brightest scientists with the most diverse minds can bring together magic in this country of ours. That is for sure. I, I agree with you 100%. As we um, scale through some of these questions, I want to ask you about M&A and what you see uh, for the industry in 2021. Obviously, you, again, have a bird's eye view. You're with Warburg Pincus. You've dealt with a lot of M&A over the years, and you're dealing with it now, I'm sure. What do you see? Is there additional consolidation in the, in the new year, or how do you see things playing out in general? There's a lot of M&A that occurs in our industry for different reasons. So smaller companies often get acquired because they may have a technology that's uh, very special to a large company and the value that's given to the investors is a much more by the larger company than if the company were to remain independent. Uh, so so that, that happens all the time. It's happening more and more as we go forward because people are realizing that uh, you, you have to access science. You cannot always grow it yourself. And the cost of capital uh, is uh, very low these days. Uh, as you know, the interest rates uh, are at historic lows. Uh, in, in Europe and Japan, they are actually below 0%. In this country, they are, if you take out inflation, they are at zero or below 0%. So interest rates are so low that uh, it's very difficult to find the home for your capital uh, elsewhere. So the propensity to spend uh, for acquisitions is much higher now than ever before. So the multiples that are being paid for different categories of assets uh, have really gone up in recent years, only because the cost of capital has, has gone down. Uh, the only comment I would make is that until recently, it used to be tech and healthcare as the two major drivers of M&A and sources of investment. Going forward, I would volunteer it's gonna be healthcare and tech. I think tech is uh, probably a little overbought right now, overinvested in. I think healthcare is coming in, in its own now, big time. And uh, especially with this uh, COVID success, people are realizing what, what you can do with bioscience. And uh, the economics are, so huge. Remember that $25 trillion number that I talked about? So if it costs $10 billion or $15 billion to have a fantastic bioscience innovation ecosystem, just look at the cost benefit of uh, having good bioscience. That's why I call this the bioscience century. That's why there's going to be a lot of action going forward. Some companies, large companies, might uh, make horizontal acquisitions in order to build up their strength or to reduce redundancies. There's been less of that in recent years uh, because the emphasis on innovation has been high and the access to small company innovation is, is pretty good. Uh, but you, I can see a time when there might be some of the larger players who might uh, want to merge with other large players. Investors sometimes don't like that because they see some negative synergies in these huge uh, 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 accumulations of uh, assets, uh, they, they, they sometimes become a little hard to manage. Uh, so uh, I see more of the smaller company space where the M&A activity is going to be very strong and also large companies buying small companies. What about from a global perspective, Craig? Are you concerned about innovation migrating away from the States to other regions of the world, uh, particularly in pharma and biotech? There is definitely competition from China because this is part of their five-year plan. They're a planned economy, and this is, this is where they want to be very good. By 2025, they want to be a power, and uh, they are adapting very quickly to the way the U.S. works. They use some of the same acronyms there as they use them here. Uh, so, so they are really going after uh, the U.S. in a big way. Uh, because they envy the fantastic bioscience ecosystem that exists in the U.S. and where the U.S. happens to be preeminent. There is no second to the U.S. in bioscience. But China aspires to be that second company, that, that second country. And there's a good chance they might get there because the Chinese entrepreneurial system is very good. Uh, there are lots of very smart people 
who are getting educated here, getting a chance to work in multinational environments, and who are going back to China to, to work in their own enterprises. Uh, so it is a bubbling ecosystem out there as well. And I think competition is good, uh, having a second country that really focused on bioscience the way the U.S. is. And ultimately, it'll improve, I think, the IP environment globally and also the pricing disparities that exist between the U.S. and countries like China. However, there is concern about some of that outmigration of talent and innovation. Is there any policies that you would recommend for our government to put into place to sort of keep um, as much of this innovation uh, domestic or stateside? Yeah, I think it's a rare opportunity for uh, the U.S. Uh, government to really make this also a priority industry. Uh, if you just look at some of the industries where we used to be excellent in the world, such as autos or computers, uh, that's uh, gone overseas in a big way. Uh, we, uh, we, we don't always look upon an American car as the car that we want to buy. Uh, it's often uh, a, a German name or a Japanese name. Uh, I, I think uh, we're, we're now uh, seeing the same challenge to bioscience in the U.S. I think the government needs to, to really look upon this as a, as a very sacred asset, a sacred treasure, especially since it leads to better economics, more jobs, high quality jobs, and also better health care for, for, for patients. Uh, unfortunately, politicians uh, are not very good at understanding this. Uh, and also not too many states have a huge bioscience industry. So they, they tend to follow the thinking in their own states and uh, it is a pity because it's, 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 an, it's an area that's it's probably the only major industry other than tech where the U.S. enjoys preeminence. And uh, therefore, I think one, one needs to try to be as competitive as possible on the world stage. And politicians need to get behind our industry. Uh, at this time, the, the, the speeches that come out of politicians are not that great in terms of favoring bioscience in this country. I see. So what about young people? Now, maybe one of the byproducts of this crisis is that more young people will go into uh, you know, the, the sciences, right? And, and yes. the hope of noble nobility and saving lives, saving the world. What do you sing or what do you recommend for young people who are considering what career they choose? I would think that now that we're seeing heroes in science and seeing a lot of people uh, on television uh, around their work, uh, around this COVID, like this lady from Hungary that I mentioned who was involved with the mRNA construct. Uh, I, I really hope this encourages a new growth in uh, visions and dreams among young people to, to go into this area. Biology is a huge area of growth. Uh, it takes, it's, it's a tougher road. It's a tougher road than going into liberal arts, uh, but I would urge uh, people to try to go here because it's very exciting. It's very cool, in my opinion, to, to understand science uh, because it changes every year and gets better. And as, as you start to understand why nature works around you the way it does, I think it's just very exciting to be in that space. So I would strongly urge any ways to get young people excited about this area and also the infrastructure to be made available so that they can learn. The fact that people can now learn through tele-learning is, is a huge opportunity uh, as well. Fred, on that positive and hopeful note, I wanna thank you for uh, coming on with us today and sharing your insights and, and for your leadership throughout the past several decades. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please like it, leave a review, and subscribe. See you soon.